Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Richard. How are you? Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, slightly jet lagged. Um, very pumped about what's going on in the world. I just spent a week in San Francisco, primarily for the Figma conference, which is called Config or Con Config. I'm not sure how they <laughs> how they pronounce it, but um, yeah, it was great. I also got to meet with lots of uh, people that I work directly with, and also some friends, and just kind of just get a general feel of what's happening in San Francisco. So yeah, we can talk about a lot of that today. Yeah, Config looked amazing. I got a chance to see some of the sessions on on demand. And you're right, that must have been a blockbuster event, but also great just reconnecting with everyone. We definitely want to spend some time talking about that, talking about um, the announcements from Config, AI and design, but there's also the human element and mm -hmm. uh, where, where we stand right now. So let's dive in. There are a lot of things that happened this week that if you haven't had a chance, go to imaginative.com and check out all the articles. Uh, we had things around litigation, open AI being sued, audio generators being sued. We had partnership announcements and uh, new models, of course, new models. But there were <laughs> three cool new tools that I would say you have to be checking out right now uh, that are AI powered. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the session. But let's start with Config. Uh, overall, mm -hmm. you um, spoke about Config last week and around everything that you expected them to be announcing with AI. On the ground, while you were there, what was the, the, the pulse like? Um, what insights can you share about that experience? Yeah, so uh, first impressions got to the Moscone Center, which is in downtown San Francisco, and there were literally lines around the block. Uh, very, <laughs> very well attended event. Uh, uh, rumors of about thirteen to 14,000 people that actually showed up for the event wow. over two days. The, wow. um, the event was broken into these big keynotes. These, they have these halls where they have these really like, you know, uh, massive venues for big keynotes. And then uh, they've also got breakout sessions. They had um, sessions for leaders. And then, of course, they've got some executive stuff as well. So I think all in all, a really good conference. I had not been before, so I can't really compare notes with, you know, something that's happened. But um, overall, I heard very, very good responses. I think a couple of people were disappointed that they had to stand in line. But I think that's maybe just the nature of the mm. venue. And I'm sure they can do something about that. Um, anyway, we... Uh, I was part of the Leadership Collective, which is uh, essentially kind of like a VIP group. These are mostly people in leadership positions who uh, get an opportunity to meet with each other. I found that incredibly valuable. Uh, if any Figma people are listening, let's do that again. Um, because the leadership conversation is obviously going to be slightly different to the practitioner conversation. Practitioners uh, would diving deep into the nuts and bolts of what is happening in Figma and AI and, and the associated generative AI world. And so I think there were lots of good conversations about, hey, you know, this thing allows me to update all my layers automatically. This thing allows me to do some auto layouts. I think those kinds of things, fascinating and interesting for the practitioner. Yeah. Uh, I did hear some people say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to just dive right into that. I think I'll currently use my Flexbox or whatever it is that I'm currently using. And, and that's really typical. I think my the first big takeaway for me at uh, this conference, but I think in general, is that whenever you are launching a new feature or a new product, the initial reaction is, gee, I'm not sure I'm going to use that, or this is not the right time, or we have to change our workflow. And there's, there's a, you know, a reasonable amount of pushback. And I think that's mm -hmm. normal. What I think, because I'm a little gray head, I've seen as well, is that pushback is normally followed by... Uh, some experimentation and then an almost uh, automatic jump into using that that product or feature. Yeah, and I think this is a this is like a bigger story. Designers, engineers, product people they tend to be quite fanatical about the tools that they use, and they're really excited about something. Um, you know, back in the day when I was just starting out in generative or in, in design and and starting to use some of these automated tools. People were getting, you know, their hair all kind of curly and excited and, you know, screaming and like, oh, my God, like, what is this new tool? Why are we doing this? And then, you know, months later, they're, they're completely adopted. <laughs> so the fanaticism works both ways. It, it feels a little bit like if you're introducing a new product, you may never actually get in there because there's so many rabid fans. 
But the truth is designers and engineers and product people do like to experiment and they do like to play with things. So, you know, if you're a startup, if you're trying something new, don't be afraid, you know, get in there. I know Figma is a beast. Adobe is a big beast. These are the 800 pound gorillas in the market, but you know, lots of good opportunity for new features and things to be introduced. So, um, you know, that's the big, first big takeaway is just like, don't be afraid, even though these yeah. big events are happening, there's lots of room for innovation. And there's also, um, you know, there's an, an, an adoption curve. It's going to take a while for the folks that use these tools to actually start using them, um, yeah. you know, when they're, they're just released. And we're not sure exactly what the outputs are going to look like. So, you know, are these kind of automatic layouts, these automatic lay, um, uh, layer tool updates, are these things actually going to produce what we want? We saw with last year Figma released dev mode. The first results were not great. Um, mm -hmm. But I think they've tweaked it and they've um, put a good team on it. And we're starting to see some really good results from dev mode. So, you know, I think we're getting there um, with all these tools. <clears throat> the next big thing was, wow, community. Everybody is looking for a human connection. And I yeah. think that's really the, the, the underlying message here is that if you are an organization and you're trying to break through, try and figure out how to introduce into your strategy a way for people to connect and build community. Chris, you and I both know the UX community has been around for a couple of decades now, mm -hmm. and it was very, very strong. It had a lot of events, had a lot of reasons to connect. Back when Smashing was having their events and, yep. you know, <laughs> there were some, some fantastic events. And then, of course, that started to get replaced by what was generally preferred a PLG type strategy, which is like self-service. We don't want to talk to you. You just go and download the product. Don't, you know, don't interrupt yeah, your day yeah. uh, with interactions. And then, of course, COVID, which was really the cherry on the top of that cocooning phase. Mm -hmm. But I think we're back. I think we've come full cycle again, which is no surprise. We're now back in a phase where people are absolutely desperate to interact with each other. They want to make friends. They want to make connections. They want to see other people doing the things that they're trying to do. And they want to build a community around that. So I spoke to Peter Meerholtz, uh, who is one of the big design people there. And both he and I agreed that, wow, this is, an, this is an opportunity for the community at large, the design community, the engineering community, and the product community to say, wow, we really don't have a lot of strong centers of gravity where we can organize ourselves around. So I think that's a strong message there if you're an organization trying to connect with uh, your practitioners or the leaders or the decision makers through an event. Uh, it mm -hmm. could just be some local community event. It could be a meetup uh, if it's for leaders put a summit together, put a workshop together, people will show up. Uh, we know uh, from the work that I've done at Knapsack and previously at Envision that events were always the most highly valued part of the interaction between us and, really? and the, uh, the customer base. And I, I just don't see that going away now. I think we obviously had a hiccup during COVID, but it's coming back strong. And then I think lastly, um, I'm just really excited to see how willing people are to participate in this change that's happening with AI. Um, there is a definitely a healthy amount of skepticism. I think it's not skepticism in the sense of like, oh, this is crap, we're not going to touch it. It's more like, hmm, I need to just make sure that this is going to come in at the right level or that we're going to test it appropriately. But every single leader that I spoke to was excited to see these AI features being added to Figma, was excited to hear AI features being added to some of the adjacent products that are working with Figma. And um, just in general kind of curiosity, which um, I, I think is a healthy way for, for the industry to be. We don't need to be just rushing into it, but we do need to be considering how we're going to start using these tools. Um, I didn't hear anybody saying, hey, we're doing massive layoff because now we can automate everything. I didn't hear any of that. I didn't hear anybody uh, worried about uh, headcount. Mostly mm -hmm. what people are concerned with is workflow. You know, are we doing the right thing for our organization? Are we putting these tools into the hands of the right people at the right time? So, yeah, I think that's those are the big themes. We can get into the, the, the details of the tools themselves if you'd like. Um, and we can we can go from there. Thank you, Richard, because I, that's great to hear from um, someone who was on the ground. Because I was a bit critical this week of the design community. I shared on social media that 
it felt like designers had taken a step back um, with the development of AI. I compared it to maybe five, six years ago when you had uh, such a vocal design community and uh, they were exploring user experiences. They were testing new user interfaces. And it feels Mm. like with AI, maybe they were shell-shocked or they were pushed out of the room and it was just the developers saying, hey, this is what uh, AI was supposed to look like. This is how it was supposed to behave. And I miss the days of seeing new test experiences that people just design mm-hmm. and say, hey, what, what about if we thought of a form behaving like this? Or what if a web page could look like this? I, I do think there is a massive opportunity right now for mm-hmm. companies that are looking to build AI products to lean in on proven design principles, to bring their designers to the table to say, hey, how can we make this an experience that people will love? One of the things that I appreciated most outside of the features, outside of the, the new tools that Figma unveiled was this philosophy that uh, seemed to underlie everything that they were doing. And they started last year with it where it was like, hey, AI isn't here to replace designers. It's here to be a tool that will accelerate design it will augment your skills and amplify them. And uh, they, there's this article that was written. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I'm going to link to it in the show notes, but I'm going to just read a paragraph from it because I, I think it's important that if you're a designer out there listening to this podcast and you're thinking, what should be my role or how should I think of AI? I think they did a really great job just articulating it. They say generative AI has been compared to the internet, electricity, and even fire. Despite these seismic expectations, most teams working on AI powered products and features say that their innovations aren't yet breaking new ground. This may owe to the fact that while developers are at the forefront of this technology, it's designers who are trying to keep pace, translating the capability into intuitive, useful experiences. In other words, the extent of AI's transformative potential may come down to how it's designed. And I I think that is so powerful because you see it in action. You see it play out when you see the AI pins of the world. You see Apple versus Google. You see OpenAI versus um, Stability AI in terms of how they're building out their products and experiences. And it just goes to show if if you're a designer out there today, if you're an organization, the opportunity that you have is to lean in on these um, skills and these people that you have as a part of your team that can truly make a difference. I, I think there's, a, there's two points in there I'd like to talk a little bit about. One is this uh, clear path that's happening right now, which is how do we get closer to code? Obviously, code is the source of truth. That's what your customer is experiencing. So regardless of what you design or mm. what the UX thinking is that goes into something, ultimately, your customer is interacting with a coded finished product Mm -hmm. right and so the code is speaks the truth if there's a bug in there or if the workflow hasn't been um, executed in the right way it shows up there yeah and i think what we're starting to see with a lot of organizations is a desire to move really close to that code and allow that code to provide some value to the ux process now Mm -hmm. what i don't see is a wholesale throwing out of hey, we're not going to do this, right? We're just not going to do any design. We're only going to do code. But what I do see is a trend towards, let's take that coded component, for example, and let that coded component arrive quickly in a prototype to see whether that thing could work. So we, we saw that. We've heard people talk about connected code. We've seen them lean into dev mode. We're mm-hmm. going to see more of this. As Adobe goes further into the larger TAM of... Um, marketers and and small businesses using Canva-like experiences, Figma needs to go further upstream to the engineering group and and start having that conversation. How can we get closer to code? So I think modern product operations is just going to have to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Code is no longer the finished part of that process where we like UX, UI, and then somebody codes it. It's going to be like, well, what is in code right now that is already validated already works, customers already like, those components already work, that form already works, how can we bring that back into the UX cycle? So I think that's the first part that I'm seeing a lot of organizations and Figma is driving that. Figma is saying, we want to go after the engineer because it's good for our business, right? They want more engineer seats. It drives their value, drives their revenue. And so they're actually creating a business case 
for that and their their enterprise sales department are going to large organizations organizations and saying you know this is going to help you make a better product yeah. the second point is we cannot forget that a lot of these problems have already been solved in terms of workflow and that we can't just say oh ui ui as it relates to um ai or ux as it relates to ai <laughs> is something completely different it's exactly. not exactly you know if you go back to good old fashioned, um, you know, I mean, I, I can't even think of how far we need to go back on this, but there are some basic principles here, some AI principles, I mean, sorry, UI and UX principles here, and we don't need to go and reinvent them. And I think one frustration is, you know, some of the PMs are saying, oh, we need new workflows. Uh, we don't really, these are human beings doing human being work. And a lot of this stuff is being solved. We've been doing a lot of this kind of, interactive work with other people and the frameworks and the thought considerations that go into this they're there if you look willing to go and find them and educate yourself so if you're a, a young pm and you're saying oh there's no workflow that you know addresses this issue well that's because you haven't spoken to all guys like me we've seen <laughs> this and we didn't even invent it we borrowed that yeah you know the lean approaches that we 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 used we borrowed from manufacturing and and so you know, there are literally a century of making things in a thoughtful way that is informing us. And we know, hey, feature factories don't always give us exactly what we want. There are other ways to do it. There are discovery methods, there are experimental methods, there are prototyping methods. All of these things exist already. We just have to go back and look at how those things can be organized around the new technologies, not the other way around. It's not the technology leading the conversation. It's how human beings work. Ultimately, I will never be out of a job because my job is to assemble and organize human beings in a way that allow them to produce something. And that's the real problem. That's never going to go away. It's, it's brilliant when you think of how Figma has really thought about integrating AI into their product. Because again, they're creating a product, they're designing a product for designers who design yeah. products. And so I'm the machine sure that makes the machine. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think of what happened uh, with tools like Figma, you got suckered into creating your layers, naming your layers, uh, creating your design system. And, and that became a job in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. And so Figma thought, well, how can we accelerate a lot of this? How can we ensure that as designers, you're not spending time doing a lot of this routine work that it wasn't what you signed up for in the first place. So some of the features that I absolutely love, um, semantic search, you can now just search in natural language and search across all your assets, either personally within your organization or within the community. So mm -hmm. the, the tool not just understands what you're writing, but it understands what you mean, which is amazing. Automatically naming your layers, because why mm -hmm. should I have to take the time to do that? And then even automatically creating prototypes. These are just simple things that I, I don't know if a designer would have thought, hey, this is this is what design is meant to be. This is what I want to spend my time doing. And they can then focus on solving the problems, asking the questions, thinking through the interactions, and then proposing the solutions that they have in mind. Yeah, I mean, my, my first book was Design Sprints, which is really just a you know ridiculous name for how to make prototypes. Um, <laughs> and how to test them. That's a great book, and by the way. It's one of my favorite books about design. Yeah, and... and you know, we wrote that book almost 10 years ago. And, and, and so, you know, back to basics. Um, this is, you know, one of the points I was trying to make earlier is that making prototypes has always been good work. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good way to work, a good workflow. A good, it's good for business. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to figure out what to do, the greatest place to start is with a prototype. You can get that in front of people. You can find proxies for real customers and experience that. And I think that's where Figma is going to have this opportunity to not only be a tool for designers, but it's just a tool for business. One of the yeah. features that they launched was was uh, Figma Slides. Uh, this kind of blew me away. I, you know, as I've become less connected to the layers of the, the kind of the design process and more towards like the presentation of what that looks like, the idea that I can take the designs, build a uh, a, a deck that explains that to executives, because most of my work now is how do I explain this thing to these people so that mm -hmm. we can make more money, right? So what is that kind of connection? And, and having slides built in there 
and I saw the product in use. There was a presentation by one of the co-founders of Figma, along with uh, the CEO of Coda, um, at one of the executive briefings. It was really good. They talked about uh, a, a topic which I think we all would, you know, be better at, and that's how to run a better meeting. And um, and they used the new slides feature to do that. And it was really impressive. I didn't even realize that they were using this new feature until right at the end when they, they said, hey, by the way, we use slides. I think it's those kinds of things. Um, at Envision, we had this, this similar vision. We had this idea that if you can take what you're doing day to day, prototyping, designing, creating, and share that with your collaborators in the medium or the channel that they are most comfortable with, you will get a collaborator. You will find somebody to say, great, I want to work with you on this. If you're sending them some beautiful design, but as a PDF, because that's the only thing that they can receive or that's the mm -hmm. only thing that you can output, you're kind of missing the point here, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we're starting to see the promise of collaboration, which has always been there as a promise, really starting to take hold now. Figma's success, massive success, is yep. key to that. And now they're taking it a step further. They're saying the other collaborator, collaborators have even adjacencies beyond just the design and engineering community. What about those people that are in the executive suite? What about the marketers? What about all the other folks that have to take this thing and turn that into a story, uh, whether it's go-to-market story um, or an executive story for fundraising? So there are a couple of parallels that I'm going to draw, not to necessarily go down those paths today, but I, I think it's important to worth noting. One, if you're a business leader, if you're a designer and you're thinking, okay, what should I do next? I'm hearing you, but what do I do? I think from my perspective, one, ensure you have uh, designers as a part of the conversation, especially um, if you're building customer facing products, um, that's going to be critical. You may have leaned or over indexed on the engineering side or on the, the technology side. Um, it's, it's time for you to, to get back to basics, bring designers as a part of that conversation so you can solve real world problems. The second point I want to make is if you watched Config, you'll notice that the CEO of uh, Figma demoed everything in a browser. They weren't using mm -hmm. a desktop app, it was mm -hmm. all browser based. And that that's the power of the internet. And if, if you think of when the internet first started, it was hard for um, maybe, entrepreneurs back then to think, what would uh, the future of technology look like? Could they think of an entire application like a Figma running in the browser? Probably not. And I, I want to just emphasize that because right now we're at that early phase of uh, AI. And it's important mm -hmm. that we think of like that long um, term approach. The, the, the technology right. may not be there today, but we, we really want to start thinking, okay, where could this really go when intelligence is built into all our tools or into all of our experiences, what could that look like? And anchor yourself in, into that reality. And then the last thing I'll point out is another story. And this I think is a great example of why technology doesn't equal business. Technology doesn't equal product. One of the announcements that we had this week was that Amazon was going to hire the founders of Adept AI and license their tech. And this is a company that within a year had been valued at a billion dollars. They were one of the best foundation models at the time. And people were excited. Wow, a new startup creating an amazing language model. And a couple months ago, there were rumors and a report by the information that they were shopping themselves around. They were trying to be bought. And Meta was in the conversation at that time. And this week, of course, the co-founders and a bunch of the team acquired by Amazon. And we saw that mm -hmm. a few months ago with inflection, Microsoft went in, right. we hired a team that was starting to struggle. We see that with stability AI, again, open source technology, amazing technology, but the technology does make a business. And at some mm -hmm. point you're an investor and you're thinking, okay, what are the types of companies that I want to be investing in? If you're a company looking to build products, you have to be thinking beyond just the technology. That's a short tail. You, you have to have that long-term vision as to where the company can right. go and how you, how you can make it there. I think this is just a good lesson for entrepreneurs. You know, we've, again, we've gone full circle. It used to be that companies would go to universities and look at what tech that they were building, and they would then either hire those, those graduates, uh, license that technology out of those universities. And so the schools were essentially the startup community, if you will. Um, and yeah. then 
for some reason, it became fashionable to make a business out of anything. Like if you just had a feature, you'd create a business around it and then you'd go and like sell that in the market. The problem with that, of course, is that probably only a handful, maybe a, a kind of single single digit uh, percentage point of the the total community would actually make it to an exit. And so the, the idea of the big exit became somewhat of a mythological thing that hasn't really delivered on the promise. So I think what you're seeing here is a more sober approach. Um, you know, you and I entrepreneurs, we know this, if somebody came to us and said, look, I don't really want to, I don't want to hire the entire thing that you've created. What I want to hire is you. I want to hire the talent. And then I want to license that technology in some way. And so these are more creative, sober ways of approaching instead of going out and doing what I saw, you know, during the dot com, which is we're going to go and buy like a whole bunch of companies and we're going to kind of push all this technology together. Uh, those kinds of mergers and acquisitions are very difficult to do from a practical point of view. They're very difficult to do from a cultural point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is just a more sobering approach, which is just like, okay, sure. You know, we don't want everything. We just want some of these things. Certainly we want the talent. And I'm sure for those founders, um, they're being taken care of. I don't know exactly the details of how they're going to benefit from it financially, but I know for a fact that, um, that these guys, if they are struggling, they're starting to see that those are better options than just yeah. like, oh, gee, I hope we get to an IPO. I hope we get it to a big exit in 10 years' time. Yeah. And it, it goes to show, and, it, and it's something that we have emphasized before, building these technologies, it's, it's expensive. It's not going to be, yeah. um, and the beauty of Dylan Field, the CEO of Figma, he was on stage and he said, you know what, for the next year, we're going to eat the cost, but we fully expect that this is something that we're going to have to find a way to uh, charge for. And we'll let you know when, when that's the case. Well, well, are they are they eating the cost or is the Adobe breakup fee of a billion dollars <laughs> eating the cost? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, wow, you're a savage, <laughs> but <laughs> this is true. Um, Adobe, Adobe really missed out. I'll, I'll say that. I think this is, an, an, uh, you know, talking about entrepreneurship, talking about startups, if you're an AI entrepreneur or you see an opportunity here, what we're really starting to see is the practical uses. We're just kind of out of that, you know, mysterious phase of like, wow, you know, what is AI for? You know, I can use it to edit my letters and I can you know, do some uh, basic stuff, but we were really starting to see applications being developed on these platforms. I recently saw uh, somebody was throwing an event. They decided that they wanted to create an event management app and they were able to use Claude 3.5 to actually create that within a few minutes, build the app that they were looking to do. They didn't need all the bells and whistles of say like meetup.com or, uh, you know, one of these other um, uh event organizing apps and so they created their own app in a couple of minutes they were able to then distribute it to the people that were going to be there uh, i think once that event was over they no longer needed that maybe they can just you know put that aside but what we're starting to see is a practical use of ai in real world cases using technologies that you and i are seeing every day right so hey why does you know 3.5 better than something that can before what, what's because you can do this kind of stuff yeah. Um, and I think that's maybe why we talk a lot about which models are important and why they're important. And these, you know, new performances, the compute that drives them, those things do matter. Maybe not obviously because it's a little behind the scenes, but it matters because suddenly you can do the things that your brain is capable of doing. Your brain is saying, well, I wish I could just create an immediate thing that solves this immediate problem. Well, now those compute cycles, the context windows are large enough for you to actually create those things and upload the data. You know that it's going to be secure. You know that it's going to be useful and you can actually start doing things with it. Now, wh whether that actually becomes a business or not, I think that goes back to our earlier conversation. Not everything has to be a business. Some things are just a feature. Some things are just a <laughs> prototype. But I think what we're starting to see is the potential for people to do very practical things that either saves money, saves time, or potentially puts them in the path of revenue. Wow. Well said. So we're, we're going to just kind of switch gears. I mm -hmm. want to talk about products that people should be using and why they should be diving into new products and trying new things, as you said. And I'll, I'll give you just like personal examples of what I spend my time doing. Last night, I 
for the first time, I was able to jailbreak Claude 3.5. And I, I so don't I normally know. spend time <laughs> trying to jailbreak models, but I saw it as a challenge. I was like, I hear people talking about jailbreaking these models all the time. How difficult it is, is, is it? What's involved? And it was a process of learning, learning more about prompting, maybe what some people call prompt engineering, but it helped me to understand the fundamentally how some of these models are processing our requests and the, the language that we're using. And in the end, it took me maybe about an hour of going back and forth with the model um, to know where I have a fully um, jailbroken Claude 3.5 that I can ask anything that will give me um, its system prompt messages. And it, it fundamentally will help me to write better prompts in the future, right? And I, I think people spending time playing with some of these new tools it may not necessarily have a business application immediately, or um, mm -hmm. you may not realize that the business application, but it one will help you to learn and to grow and to just flex those creative muscles. And, but also down the road, it may be something that you are able to apply to a problem that you're having. And so there, there are three tools that I think everyone should be using today. Mm -hmm. The first is going to be Anthropics Cloud. Claude is amazing. Maybe you're using OpenAI's ChatGPT. Maybe you're using Copilot. Um, this isn't to say that Claude needs to replace them, but I think seeing the experience that you can get using projects and artifacts and what you can build, as you said, with, with Claude 3.5, it's worth noting. And so go, it's free. Create an account um, at Claude.ai. Um, check out Claude 3.5. The second is 11 Labs' new reader app. And a reader app, basically, mm -hmm. for those that don't know, allows you to add articles or PDFs or research that you may have stored in the past or that you want to read at some point and then um, read it later. But what 11 Labs has done is to say, hey, we're going to turn these into audio for you. So let's say you're commuting mm -hmm. and you want to consume a research paper or you want to consume a Or you're dyslexic. And you don't exactly read. right exactly it's it's a brilliant experience and of course some of these tools have it but uh this is going to be a really great experience the, the language and the, the 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 voices sound very human they have uh, uh, personalities within the the voices i think you're going to enjoy it and again try it maybe you like it maybe you won't like it but it's, it's worth learning about these tools and the last tool is chat gpt desktop if you are using ChatGPT on the web, the desktop app will make you that much more productive. Uh, you can give it access to seeing what you're seeing on your screen. So let's say you're working on a, on a table and you want to just ask a quick question to ChatGPT about that table. You no longer have to get that file, upload it into uh, the, the ChatGPT app and then ask questions. You can literally with a keystroke, uh, just have the AI see what you're looking at and then ask questions. It's it's brilliant, and it, and it's I think these are going to be ways in which we start thinking. Oh, what could this experience feel like and look like when we have AI running across our entire operating system that can work mm -hmm. alongside me and my coworkers versus mm -hmm. me just working with this chatbot in, in this transactional way. So three tools. Have you used any of them, Richard? What are, what are you thinking about them? Yeah. So the the second tool, um, you know, this idea of, of being able to turn things into audio makes a lot of sense for me. I again, uh, a lot of the work that I'm involved in is taking somewhat complex ideas, whether it's the way a software performs or how a platform is valuable to an organization and taking the ideas that product and engineering are delivering and translating that into something that is a much more easy to understand story. And so what I often do is I will take those stories and actually construct them or construct those ideas as stories. So I'm using mm -hmm. typical narrative here. Um, a story arc, a beginning, a middle, and end, or in some cases, what is the pain? What is the solution? And um, and and what I have done in the past, and what I continue to do, and what these tools will be able to help me do is, how do I tell that story to an executive? How do I tell that story to a marketer? All of these personas are different. They're going to have a different kind of narrative. And so, what I can prompt that application to do is say, "This is the complexity of what we're dealing with. This is the benefit of using these tools." How would you then help me craft a, a verbal narrative that I can then use to either repeat myself or yeah. practice yeah. or use directly to send to those individuals? Because each of those narratives are going to be different. And uh, to your point about GPT, your desktop, uh, if I've got a big piece of 
data, which uh, in one case I've got like this huge um, spreadsheet of persona data that I've, that I've kind of gleaned from other people within the organization. I can take that persona data. I can say, hey, ChatGPT, I got a lot of different information, a lot of different constituents that are trying to understand the story. Here is the story. Here are the people. Come up with a bunch of narratives. And then let's also then export those into different channels so that we got a, a way to do that. Ordinarily, that would take me you know, weeks or months to do yeah. um, and lots of different cycles. Now I can get that done in a short period of time, probably just an hour or so, get that out to the audiences, see how it lands, make sure that what I'm, what I'm trying to say is actually landing in the way that, it, that, that, that was intended, get the feedback that's necessary, make the tweaks, and then go to the next round. So I think just the speed of work here, again, I, I don't know if I'm a productivity freak. I don't think I'm one of those people who needs to hack every part of my life. But the idea that I don't need to do this kind of mundane, boring, repetitive work really appeals to me because now I can focus on the thing that I really value as a human being. And that's you know, problem solving, you know, critical thinking, creative work. Those are the things that I value as a human being, both for myself and the people that I work for. And so these tools are helping us do exactly that. I love that. In fact, I think what we should do maybe is to create some videos for listeners and um, you can let us know if um, this is the sort of content that you'd be interested in. But I love those use cases that you describe and I have some use cases also. Maybe we should create some videos, just kind of tutorials about how we're using mm -hmm. things like Cloud3 um, point five projects and um, the chat yep. GP desktop app that, that people find valuable. All right. Yeah, I think I last, would love that. Last set of things that I think we'd want to discuss before we wrap up today. Lawsuits, AI ethics, partnerships, right? Uh, we saw a bunch of partnerships this week. Um, Time Magazine partnering with Eleven Labs to bring audio um, to their articles. Time Magazine partnering with OpenAI to um, supply them with their data. Uh, we saw YouTube partnering with the record labels uh, to try and license music to train their AI models. We saw the record labels suing uh, Suno and Udio for copyright mm -hmm. infringement. We saw Created by Humans coming up with this novel approach to how creators can be paid for content that's used to train AI models. And then we saw the Center for Investigative Reporting, the, the parent company of Mother Jones and Reveal, suing open AI for copyright infringement. And so you're, you're all of the, like this dance that's happening right now, right? With these bigger companies saying, hey, we want a piece of the pie to these yeah. uh, people that are developing the technology and also legitimate concerns about what's going to happen to the future of their business if they just allow this to, to go undisturbed. And then, of course, you're, you're seeing these partnerships happen. What are your thoughts on them? Did any of these stand out to you? Yeah, well, I, not to bring everything back to config, but I was actually in a conversation with people at Warner Music and CNN. A lot of these content providers are having exactly these conversations. There is the preemptive approach, which is for the AI companies or the content providers to actually pr go directly to the other party and say, look, before we get into a lawsuit, let's come up with a deal. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing with, say, OpenAI and, and Time. And we've seen that with Reddit. We've seen that with a bunch of others, right? They're all yeah. trying to do the deal that's necessary. The problem, of course, is that these models have already been trained. They're already doing things that aren't, you know, haven't been included in those deals. So unless those deals are attractive, there is going to be some lawsuits. Now, do I think that all these lawsuits are going to go to court? Probably not. I think they're probably going to be settled in the form that we're seeing, which is, okay, great. We screwed up. We, we trained our model on your content. We're going to pay you. For most of these AI companies, that's a rounding error, $50 million a year for you know, content is not yeah. a lot of money for them. It's pretty much the interest that they're getting on on their their funds, Literally. Um, and for and for the, the 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 you know the producers of these creative uh, products of content. That's a lot of money for them because a lot of them are struggling. Their margins are pretty low. They haven't actually um, solved the problem with the paywalls that they've got. Now we are hearing from the people within the product design, product uh, creative world, the engineers inside these these. Uh, companies that they are looking for better solutions they are looking to ai to produce solutions for themselves so that's the kind of the third mm -hmm. person in the dance if ai companies like open ai and microsoft and, and google are one party in the dance and the other party is the publisher the content creator the third party is 
how do we actually use this content to create a better solution? Is there a better way for us to manage distributions? Is there a better way for us to manage, uh, you know, the revenue cycles? Because a lot of the artists are getting screwed. Yep. You know, I think, I think the artist here is not being represented directly. They're being represented through a lot of other companies. So I, I honestly don't know this space well enough to tell you that, you know, I have a strong opinion on any of these things. But I think the word that you use, it's a dance. It's going to happen for a while. We're going to see these stories coming up over and over again. I don't think it's going to play out. It's all, At least it's not going to finish playing out for a while. Uh, we're going to get a lot of people trying to get a piece of this big pie. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so too. Um, two things stood out for me that I'll, I'll, I'll just highlight. I think the methodology that the record labels use to find out if these companies were training AI on their models. Um, they, they explain some of it in the law. So you can read the article to, to find out how they actually were able to use these tools to reproduce uh, music that was very similar to, to yeah. content that they had created. It I seems a little was... dodgy, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it does, but it, it also just kind of shows you the holes in these models and the whole with the right words, with the right prompts, you'll be able to really pull out a lot of functionality and capabilities out of these models. Yeah. The, the second part of the story that we, we didn't get to dive into a lot this week, but uh, you had Mustafa Suleiman, uh, who was the former um, head of Inflection that was acquired basically mm -hmm. by Microsoft and who now leads their uh, Microsoft AI efforts. He was in an interview and he basically said, there's a social contract that has existed on the internet since the dawn of time that, hey, if you, you have content on the internet and you didn't explicitly say do not scrape this content do not access this content with our bots that it's fair game for anyone mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i think that's turning a lot of heads a lot of people are, are mm -hmm. looking at their starting to ask well is is this true one um should it be true but also what does that mean for creators and for anybody that has put content out on on the internet so um if if you mm -hmm. haven't seen that video we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes also but a lot of conversations basically happening in this space around intellectual property around um copyrights and um just compensation for creators and so i would, I would highly encourage you um to one learn about the conversations, educate yourself on it and participate in them because the technology will, will evolve as we as a collective, as a society decide to do that. And of course, the US government has put out open requests for people to give feedback as to how they feel about like IP laws and AI. And so feel free to, to share your voice with the government, but also on social media. And um, talk about how you see it if you're a creator, an artist, if you are a content provider, um, or distributor. Um, I'd love to hear some perspectives on this. With that, Richard, I think we should wrap up this week. I, I know yeah, you're a bit of that, but um, there are so many stories, everyone, that uh, you can check out on imaginative.com. And we'd love to get feedback from you as usual. So send us messages, keep them coming. But as always, just hit that like button on YouTube. Um, it really does a lot in terms of the visibility of our content. Um, and let us know if there's um, content that you're interested in. As always, we love you. Um, thanks for all the support. Um, until next time, one love.